Good evening, everyone, and a really warm welcome to your Co-op Live. I'm Lynn Warner, and I'm joined tonight by my colleague and co-host, Helen Raven, and we're both part of the community team at the East of England Co-op. We're really delighted to be streaming live from Colchester Food Bank, which is now the biggest in our region. I think it's fair to say that with the increased costs of living, we're all being stretched financially. So tonight we're joined by a panel of experts who will be passing on their practical advice to help us cope and manage the difficulties we may be experiencing. This really couldn't be a more pertinent subject as we're currently celebrating Co-op Fortnight, which focuses on why being part of a co-op is a great way to improve the lives of people and their communities. Your Co-op Live is for our members and our customers, so we're giving you all a voice. We're committed to offering value for money to our customers, and we've got a number of schemes in place to help with this, including our Co-op Guide to Dating, where we offer products at 10p in store that are still safe to eat, but past their best before date. We're also working with Too Good To Go, which is an innovative food saving app which lets you buy and collect magic bags of unsolved food at greatly reduced prices so it gets eaten instead of wasted. Once you've registered with the app, you can apply for a magic bag which are available in our stores for £3.30 and contain food that's worth at least three times that value. In addition, we also give support to families by accepting healthy start vouchers in store with a top up on the 425 value to £5. This year in particular, there's going to be some real challenges for families over the school summer holidays. So if you're an East of England co-op member and looking for something to do with the family, then check out your member perks on our website, where we're offering some really great deals on days out, concerts, restaurants, trips to the zoos, and much more. There's also the fantastic art trail, the Big Hoot in Ipswich, which is free and will get the family outside enjoying some exercise and fresh air. But just don't forget to stop by and visit our future holder, Big Hoot, which is in Cornhill in the middle of Ipswich. So without further ado, Helen, who have we got on tonight's show? So hi, everyone. Uh, first up, I'd like to introduce Michael Beckett to the show. Uh, Michael is the Chief Executive here at Colchester Food Bank. So firstly, thank you so much, Michael, for having us here tonight at the Food Bank. We're um, really pleased to be here. Um, I'd also like to welcome Kiara Saunders, who is Chief Executive of Citizens Advice Bureau um, in East Suffolk. And finally, local chef Emma Crowhurst, um, who will be showing us how to make our food and our money go uh, a bit further. So thank you all uh, for coming this evening and for joining us here in uh, the city of Colchester. So please don't forget that this is an interactive event and we really want to hear from you. Um, you can ask questions throughout the evening uh, by using the tab on the right hand side of your screen. Or shall we slide <laughs> those? Um, you'll be able to see what questions uh, other people are asking. So if someone ask, asks a question that you really want to see answered, uh, click on that to give it a thumbs up and that will move it to, to the top of the list and we'll do our very best to get through as many of those questions as possible this evening. So at the East of England Co-op, we support 25 food banks across Essex, Suffolk and Norfolk, and we do that through cash donations and also by having the collection points in our food stores. Now, some of our viewers here in Colchester will know that we support uh, Colchester Food Bank in, in our local stores. So we're delighted to be here this evening with Michael and his team, and thank you again, Michael, for having us. Um, so, Michael, first of all, can you explain uh, to our viewers at home uh, how the food bank operates and how someone can access the facility you run here? Okay, uh, we are the busiest food bank uh, in the east of England um, and we operate by providing emergency food parcels. Uh, you need to obviously get a voucher to come here um, because we don't want someone to be stuck in poverty. We want them to be getting um, a solution to their problem and moving forward. So maybe citizens advice, maybe a social worker, maybe a charity will be helping them to get through their problem and then referring them to us so that we can keep them going. Um, if someone is stuck in a hole or in the water, what we really want to do is get them out of the water or out of the hole and provide them with a food parcel once they're on the way out. Um, so that they're not stuck in a problem and being thrown food at, because that doesn't really help them. Yeah, so it's part of a sort of bigger uh, bigger help package, as it were. Yes. Okay, and so you mentioned the uh, food parcels there, and we've got um, a food parcel here, basically. <laughs> it's one we prepared uh, earlier. One we prepared earlier. So um, could, could you just sort of run us through uh, uh, what's here and, and what... Uh, yeah. 
what so you need, really. we've got things like long life milk, long life juice, um, meat, uh, fish, uh, fruit, um, pasta, rice, uh, squash. Um, we've got biscuits, we've got tea, we've got uh, tinned tomatoes, tinned potatoes, tinned rice pudding, tinned custard, um, tinned vegetables, jam, uh, tomatoes, uh, pasta sauce, all in a parcel, nutritionally balanced uh, to provide people with a, a okay. food for the week. Uh, for a week though? Is well, this is nutritionally balanced days, for three days, for right, three square yeah. meals, mm -hmm. but with all the extra food we give, it's probably about a week's worth that they can take home in the end. Okay. And, you, and you've got sort of some biscuits there, so as, as well as those kind of staples, you also sort of like to, particularly for families, I guess, having yeah. those little treats as well is, is quite nice to have. If you've got kids um, and you need, mm. and if, if, if life is a bit rubbish at the moment, um, giving someone a bit of a treat to help them get through that whilst you're going through a crisis, you know, be it domestic violence, be it a loss of a job, or be it waiting for benefits to come through, um, whatever it is, children probably don't understand and giving them a bit of chocolate to get them through mm. is, is probably probably the, the least worst thing you can do yeah. and probably what you need to do um, to get them through the crisis. Yeah, absolutely. So um, looking around, obviously we can see a lot of, uh, lot of food here, um, but also just up in the corner, you've, um, there's also sort of uh, some school uniforms and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, does, does someone have to sort of follow that same criteria going to an agency and getting, and getting put through to you to be able to access those, um, those sorts of services as well? Well, we share this site with four other charities. So we've got a refugee charity, Bridgeway. We've got um, the Tots to Teens Baby Bank. Um, they've got their own uh, criteria. You can contact them via Facebook. And we've got um, the Uniform Exchange and they've got their own telephone number and things, but people can come in and see them and they can give them school uniforms. And if your kids have grown too large, you can take in your old school uniforms to give to someone else. And so that works quite well. And then we've got Refocus who do art therapy. And because in 2020, 42% of our clients were children and in 2021, it rose to 43%. With that many kids, we just felt being a one-stop shop where people can get these things and they can get help for their kids at the same time as getting a food pass. So it helps people get out of crisis sooner and it certainly makes the path easier for kids. Yeah, absolutely. So um, looking at the unit here, it's, it's massive, but this, this isn't the only, um, the only centre you have here in Colchester, is it? Uh, we've got seven um, centres throughout Colchester and in the neighbouring towns of Brightlingsea, Wivenhoe and Tiptree. Right. Ten in all. Wow, OK. Um, so there will be some people uh, watching tonight who, who want to donate products um, and, w and we've sort of talked through the food parcel here, but is, is that sort of all, all that you want? What's what sort of you're on the desperate list at the moment? What are you short of? Well, long life juice, long life milk, uh, tinned custard, tinned rice pudding, jam, uh, tea bags. These are all things we are short of and we could do with more. And certainly things like washing powder and deodorant are things that we are always running out of and, uh, you know, We've run out of those this week, so it would be very helpful to have donations of those to top it up. Okay, that would be so, very so it's not just food you're after, is, is those sort of other household, household products and, and personal sort of products that you're, that you're looking for as well? Well, it costs a lot of money if people lose their house, mm. if they lose their job, if they lose their kids because they can't send them to school clean. So helping people to be able to be presentable and be able to maintain their life saves the state a lot of money, saves people a lot of heartache and, and helps people just get through the crisis and on with their life, which is in everyone's best interest. OK, so that's so it's it's those sorts of things and those other products that you're that you're looking for people to pop in those uh, food bank collection points. Yes, outdoors. that would be brilliant if they could or if they wanted to make a donation, a monthly donation would be helpful. Um, they are both good um, and um, we do our best to make sure that everyone in need gets them. Fantastic. Um, so uh, we have had some questions in. Um, interesting that you mentioned the cash there and, and the goods uh, for the food bank. So uh, someone's asking, is it better to donate money or uh, goods to the food bank? That's a very good question. I suppose <laughs> if you are able to go to your store and can donate the goods we need, then that is brilliant. But some people can't, um, for whatever reason, uh, find it hard to actually leave the house. Mm. Um, it might be better to give money in that case. Um, certainly my treasurer would prefer money and my warehouse supervisor would prefer food, food, food items. And all I can say is I can't please them both. So um, whatever is easier for you, if you can give it to us, that will really, really help the food bank. So thank you. Yes, please. Fantastic. Um, another question we've had in is um, I'm employed, but on a very low salary. Uh, can I still access, um, access the food bank? Yes. So um, people who are on low income can. They can be referred, uh, be it through their union, be it through... 
uh, help from a charity like Citizens Advice or from some other specialist worker or from a school. Um, as long as they're getting help to get, solve their problem, we will provide them with a food parcel uh, and help them get it. So yes, people who are just about managing, people who are struggling now with the cost of living crisis, the food bank can help them get through this. Okay. You, you mentioned earlier about the voucher. So someone brings the voucher in and they get that parcel, which is those, the three-day emergency care. Do they, can they come back for another voucher or is that go back? They, they go back to the agency, there. the agency does it. That way they are engaging with the agency, getting the help and continuing to resolve their problem. And the, you know, the plan is that they get resolved whatever the problems are. And it might be several problems, it might be one problem, um, but resolving the problems so that they don't need the food bank. And that's where we want to get them to. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, it may be that they just need one or two or three or four vouchers to get through the problem. It may be they need more because it's a substantial problem. You know, if something's snowballed where several things have gone on and there's, there's lots of problems, it might take longer to solve. Yeah. But what we're concerned about is not how many times they need help, but that we have a clear path for them to get out of needing help and be able to be independent and get on with their life. Right. OK, because it's, it's, it's a range of issues, isn't it? I mean, you know, you sort of mentioned we saw their sort of people on low salary, but it's also people who are unwell and who can't work. And so there's a range of reasons why people would need that emergency, emergency food. Yeah, it could be waiting for benefits to come through. It could be uh, waiting for a payment to come through. Um, or it could be that they've made, made redundant. Uh, it could be that their partner left them, cleared the bank account, cleared the fridge, cleared everything and left them with debts. Um, these things do happen and people who never thought they would need a food bank suddenly do because the worst has happened to them. A, a colleague has accused them of something at work and they, they've lost their job or something they said on Twitter was taken wrongly or whatever. You know, it could happen to anyone. Hopefully we'll never be in that situation ourselves, but just in case, you know, the food bank is there as a safety net and we do provide that support and help to people when they're in crisis. Obviously we hope you never need to use our services, but if you do, we're there for you. Fantastic. Um, and. Uh, sort of just speaking there about the, t um, the, the people that can use the food bank. Someone's asked, um, are homeless people able to access the food bank? Yes, homeless people can use the food bank. Um, what I'd say is that generally most homeless people choose not to because what they're looking for is a hot meal. Mm. Um, certainly six carrier bags <laughs> is a lot of things to carry around with you if you're yeah. street homeless. And most people who are street homeless wouldn't want six carrier bags. They would want a hot meal. They would like maybe go to the day centre. They might meet up with their friends. Uh, and there are other services available for street homeless people. Um, but if they're being moved into accommodation, then um, that can work with the resettlement worker getting a parcel. Um, and certainly if someone's sofa surfing and living you know, in someone else's house, they might prefer a kettle parcel because they've only got access to a kettle and not access to a full kitchen. So we provide those so that people can do that. Right. It's about giving, making sure people can access food that they can actually eat, mm. um, that they can have and, and use. And I would say about 1% of our clients probably are, you know, homeless. Um, uh, but it's usually when they're coming out of homelessness or just before they go into it that, that we are helping them. Mm. Um, but when, when they actually are homeless, you, usually they just want a kettle parcel or something like that because they're actually staying on someone's sofa. Mm. It's, you mentioned sort of tailoring, tailoring what you do for people. And, you, and yeah. you mentioned before we came on air about sort of lactose intolerance and, and gluten free and all those sorts of things. So you have kind of you take those sorts of things into account as well, don't you? Yes. Um, we've had people who want kosher um, or halal, people who are vegetarian or vegan, people who can't for whatever reason, um, eat different food groups. Um, now, it may or may not be possible that we can give them everything they want, but we can certainly give them most of what they want and provide them with uh, a food to keep them going. Uh, and um, we do the best we can with the resources we have to make sure these people get the food they need, yeah. um, e even though they might have quite specific mm, mm. dietary requirements. Yeah. So that's, that's another good thing to mention, actually. Again, if you're popping something in the food bank collection points, think, think about those sorts of things as well. Um, so uh, one, another question, what support is available for those that can't reach a food bank by car, bus, and do you ensure charities tell their clients that you exist and how to find you? Okay, well, some other organisations do um, deliver food uh, to people's houses uh, if they've got um, particular disability or mobility needs uh, but that's certainly not something we like to do uh, you know unless we have to um, and most people come to the food bank to get help uh, and and you know yeah. move through the problems we do have um, 
the reason for the food bank moving out to the areas where there is most need is so that people don't have to travel so far so it is easier to reach the food bank. Obviously some people might have to go further but we have moved the food bank to the people by uh, opening more centres uh, so people can do it and you know we do do ranges of things so that people get the food that they need and maybe cat food or dog food if they've got pets um, uh, just the things they need so they can move through mm -hmm. and, and keep the household fed and looked after yeah okay so um, we have another question um, how do you ensure that food donations go to the most needy in society obviously that you get people coming to you with those vouchers as you mentioned earlier yeah. don't you so so we've got 265 partner agencies and the partner agencies they're the ones who check whether people need help mm. um, you know they've these are people who've worked with people for years and know who needs help uh, and um, how much help to give them and and you know what to expect in return to try and help make sure people move on and get the least disruption to their lives and the most help to get through and on with their life and back to normal yeah. um, and we certainly do you know without our partner agencies and without the support of the public we wouldn't be able to provide the service that we do but because of that support we are able to get the people who have the most need and get the food there and, and mm -hmm. that makes the difference and it means that people don't don't go from one crisis into a complete meltdown and mm. um, most of what we do is prevention like the iceberg it's the bits you can't see we're stopping things from getting worse we're stopping people from losing their children into care or losing their house and going homeless or losing their job uh, and stopping things from going from bad to worse mm. uh, and then helping people get back on their feet and carry on with their life and that I yeah. think just saves so much money time and cost it, it, it's I think virtually in incalculable yeah, like I say, it's, it's crisis points, isn't it? They yeah. are at crisis points, so it's when, you know, that's when um, that intervention comes in and yeah. it's really needed, really. Okay, um, so uh, what about, a um, question here about the fresh food, um, and, and we, yeah. Lynn and I did a tour recently and we, and we saw that you do fresh food. That's something you do here at the Culture yeah. Food Bank. We've got um, fresh bread products, we've got... Uh, fruit, vegetables, people can pick what they like. And if they're carrotist, for example, and can't eat carrots, then we don't give them <laughs> carrots. Um, you know, it's about giving them the food that they want. If they like spuds, we can give them spuds, um, you know, but we, we offer them what we've got and um, they go home carrying the food and ready to eat. That they want, yeah. yeah. Okay, um, so Helen has asked a question. Um, how do you, how can she donate money to the food bank? How is that? Okay, well, um, there are various ways to do it, but on our website, colchester.foodbank.org.uk, um, there is a Donate to Us page which shows um, how to give money, uh, shows various different ways. Um, people can certainly give monthly or they can give a one-off, uh, or they can fundraise from us through things like just giving and do a fundraising event or um, do it with um, their, their street. Um, wow. What we've you know, anything they're able to give, we'd appreciate it. Um, even if they just want to collect change in a jar and donate the jar to the food bank when it's full. Yeah. You know, these all, th these all help us and gives my treasurer something to do. <laughs> Um, so uh, we talked earlier about sort of the things that you're desperate um, uh, for in terms of the food parcels at the moment, but someone's asked, what is the most useful type of food I can give to a food bank? Uh, well, if you look at the food bank's social media, they're usually posting the things that they're most short of at the moment. So we've posted things like um, tinned custard and tinned rice pudding, things like tea bags and jam. And these are things that we've run out of recently and that we really need. And we ask for and people give it to us. And we're really, really grateful when they do because it keeps us going. Uh, and usually what happens is we get a load of stuff in that we need and then something else. <laughs> 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 runs out um so it is a bit like chasing after whichever thing we, we need we need most but you know if it wasn't for the generosity of the public supporting us we wouldn't be able to um continue to provide the service we do and we've got busier and busier uh, and the public have been so great at, at providing the support we need so that we can provide these meals mm. uh, and keep people um able to yeah. keep on with their life so like you say we you the now the busiest the largest food bank in in the the east of um, England that's 
And that's not something, obviously. <laughs> not something we aspire to do. No, we aspire to close by 2030. Um, nice. But we've gone from being the third busiest in the east of England and the busiest in Essex in 2019 to the second busiest in 2020. And then in 2021, we became the busiest. This isn't something we tried to do. I think it's something about where other food banks are and whatever. And we straddle a larger area than just Colchester. But, you know, it is what it is. Um, we, we've done our best to meet the needs and to make sure people don't suffer. And um, we, you know, we won't let people suffer. That's why we're here. Yeah, fantastic. OK, um, one final question, I think. Um, so there is, uh, there is a local food bank in my town. This is from Melissa. Um, but there wasn't the option to have the five pound go to them. Do you think that, that will always, there will always be a need for food banks? I mean, I think, like you say, your ambition is to not be here in 2030. Well, I think it's a question of political will. Um, when the politicians decided um, during COVID to remove homelessness, there was no street homeless. They got them all into housing. Um, you know, there is the government have the power to do this if they choose to. Um, and um, providing enough basic income so people don't need to use the food bank is possible. It just requires political will. And I suppose that's a question for politicians as to whether they want to offer that to the public mm. um you know what we'd say is we've campaigned on issues like um, ending the two child limit for benefits uh, reducing the waiting time for universal credit uh, an uplift to benefits and um, a real living wage that keeps up with inflation these are things that we've campaigned for because we believe that they will reduce demand for the food bank and we're committed to reducing demand for the food bank in the long term but at the moment demand's going the wrong way it's going up yeah yeah well, thank you for doing doing what you do, really, Michael. And um, to thank you uh, for obviously having us here tonight and, and to all of you at home for asking those questions. Um, as Michael said, he, there's obviously a Colchester Food Bank website uh, that will be listed on, um, on our website and um, all of the other food banks that, that we support, their details are on there as well. Um, don't forget that you can keep asking those questions throughout the evening and we'll try to get through as many as possible. Uh, now back to you, Lynn. Thanks, Helen. Now I'm joined by our next guest, Kiara Saunders, um, who's the newly appointed Chief uh, Executive of Citizens Advice in East Suffolk. So congratulations, Kiara. Um, I'd like to start off by asking you to explain what support Citizens Advice are able to offer those of us who are struggling with our finances at the moment. Um, I'd always assume that Citizens Advice really focused on uh, consumer complaints and helping people who have um, issues around that, but you offer so much more, don't you? Yes, I mean, that's right. We do offer um, support for people with consumer issues and we will advise on that and we have a helpline for it. But we cover a range of issues where we offer advice. So it could be benefits and that is how to access benefits. Do I qualify for any benefits? Am I getting all the benefits I'm entitled to? Or how do I actually fill this form in or understand the form? Because they are quite complicated. And also we do employment issues, housing issues. So that's not just social housing. You know, if you're in private rented and there's a leak and you're not sure it's your responsibility or the landlords, maybe you're having a problem with your neighbor, we will help you and advise you as to how to proceed with that. Um, we will also deal with family issues, so family breakdowns. You know, if, if you suddenly you don't know what to do, you've been left, you, you want to figure out the next steps. And we deal with debt, which is obviously a big issue at the moment. And it, it, when I say debt, I don't mean sort of people who are, you know, so much in debt that they're looking at bankruptcy. De debt covers a wide range. So you could just be struggling with paying an electricity bill, for example. We will help the whole range there. Yeah, so in, in terms of fuel costs, which are escalating out of mm. control at the moment, um, can you explain a little bit more about how you've been able to help um, people that have, have come into your um, service? Well, Citizens Advice may have access to um, hardship funds or at least can um, point you towards, signpost you to where um, hardship support is available. And that's like sort of immediate sort of sticking plaster if you have a problem. But given that the high prices are here for a while, people also need a sort of longer term um, solution. So we will help with that and we will advocate for them. And at the moment, you know, one thing we, there was a time when all the um, sort of uh, monthly direct debits seemed to be going up quite high and people were getting quite big shocks with them. And for example, for one client, you know, it, it meant that we phoned up and we negotiated for them. Some people can 
advocate for themselves, but others find it difficult, uh, you know, so we will ring up and we'll say, look, this is what the client's saying, this is usage, this is what he thinks he can cut back, does he really need to have an increase of that amount? And we try to find uh, an amount that the client can afford to pay, but without the client then falling into arrears, which, you know, is getting that balance right. Um, but also we would help a client maybe look at their own income and expenditure and see, you know, what they can do that might help them to manage their household payments better. No, that's a really fantastic service. Um, you also touched on debt management. Um, can you explain a little bit more about how your volunteers are able to help people in debt? Well, Citizens Advice is FCA regulated, so the advice you get um, is managed properly. And if, if you come to us, uh, the first thing that usually happens is that you have a, a debt assessment. So we will look at the type of debt you have, because the type of debt will uh, affect what is available to you. Um, and we will look at the amount of debt you have and, and all the different factors that could affect the different solutions that are available to you. And then we will present those solutions that are suitable to your case to you and you, the client, chooses the one that suits you the best. And it, it's a journey. So it's not a question of you coming in the door and we saying, well, you know, mate, you've got to sort of pay it back. We will sit down and work it through. It's a journey. That's great. Now, if somebody hasn't used the services of Citizens Advice before, how do they go about getting in touch? Can they just walk in off the street? Do they need to make an appointment? It'll depend on your local Citizens Advice. So the best thing to do is go on to the website of citizensadvice.org. Um, there, there is information that might actually help you solve your problem or at least give you some basic information to start with. And then there is a box um, at the bottom which will, you can put your postcode in and it will take you to the page with your closest citizen's advice or um, there may be more than one that's near you. And you'll have the phone number and their website and you'll be able then to see when they're open, whether they offer drop-in or appointment only. Um, and one thing that they may offer is um, uh, email advice. So, so some people, if you're working a full day, it's actually quite nice to be able to go home in the evening and write the email than trying to pop out the office and make a phone call. And some of the offices offering web chat as well. So check what your local office offers and, and then use the service that is best suited to your requirements. And have you seen the volume of people coming to you increase significantly in the past few months? Well, I mean, it Yes, I mean, and it, it's more the, the problems that they come with that's quite interesting to see. So yes, we do see an increase, and at the moment we're seeing an increase in people who are having problems um, with evictions, particularly where it's private rented, where maybe the landlords are thinking, you know, it's not worth my while to rent anymore, or it would be better for me to sell the property. Um, so, or rent increases is another thing we're seeing, that people cannot afford the rent increases that they're being presented with. We have a lot of people coming to us with, um, who are struggling to make ends meet. So we do the referrals to the food banks is one side of it. But we also, as Michael um, mentioned, we, we look at the, the whole situation. So it's not a question you come in, you say, oh, we want a food parcel and we send you off. We will look at why you want it and, and how we can help you come out of that need. Um, so we are seeing an increase in these demands and obviously energy has been a big issue as well and then tied in with that obviously is is benefits because people will come and see you know what else can they maybe access to help them manage yeah. so as a result of this increase um, do you need more volunteers oh we'd love to have more volunteers um, that's always um, so we rely citizens advice generally has a, a core of paid staff and then relies on volunteer advisors to answer the phones and even to do the face-to-face -face and the web chat. So we, they are the, sort of the beating heart of, of how we work and we, we would love to have more advisors. We train people up. There are different things that you can volunteer for, so you shouldn't be put off. It's always worth inquiring. And for younger people, it can be a really good thing to have on your CV if you're then going on to look for work. So this is not you know, just for older people or people who've retired. So yes. And how do people go about volunteering? So mostly, it'll either be on the Citizens Advice uh, main website, there'll be the option, or most of the um, Citizens Advice local offices that have their own websites, 
there'll be an option there to how you volunteer and how you apply. Otherwise, just email in or phone. Okay. Yeah. And we'll obviously have details of all of that on our website after tonight's programme. Um, now, let's take a few questions. Um, so, we've got a question that's come in. Um, somebody's struggling to make the monthly repayments on their loan. Um, so, do citizens of the advice charge a fee for the debt management service? No, our services are free. When you come to us and we advise you, it is all free. Fantastic. Okay. Um, have you got any plans for pop-up citizens' advice um, for remote or deprived areas? Yes. Um, the, the balance of that is when you have to have the, the right environment to do, you know, it has to be confidential, the clients are coming to see you. Two, you have to have the resources, hence please do apply to be volunteers, because the more volunteers we have, the more we can cover. Um, and yes, we do. So um, in East Suffolk, where I work, um, we run four outreaches in the centre of um, East Suffolk out of libraries. So we do look at doing that, but every citizen's advice is hampered by what's available in terms of uh, venue and what's available in terms of resources. But yes, it's important. Uh, somebody else has asked here, um, how is citizens' advice funded and do the government help you? Um, citizens' advice is, each citizens' advice um, is a separate entity, legal entity, and each citizens' advice can be funded differently. So historically, the funding came from the local council and the district council in Suffolk, where we've got the split system. But um, not all citizens advice benefit from that. So we also get um, project funding. We, we have people who um, donate to us, which is, you know, we're really grateful for. Sometimes parish councils will, will help us because we're very active in the areas. Uh, we sometimes get charitable um, donations. So sometimes it may be businesses who who would provide um some funding so it's a it's a no one there is no one set um way of being funded and funding is tight obviously it is and, and at the moment there's the difficulty of the fact that we've got an increased demand at a time when finances mm. are being strangled so it is tight it is difficult um and and i think most citizens advice would say funding is always something that you've got to be working towards, and you've got to be trying to encourage and, and look for new funders. Um, right, we've got another question that's popped up here. Um, on the pop-up theme, would you, could you run a van like the mobile banking van to visit remote or deprived areas? Some citizens advice, um, I don't think within um, the east of England, I could be wrong, but run one. I've, I've heard other citizens advice when I talk to them, but to do that, you have to have the money to buy the uh, van and then you have to have the volunteers who run it so it, it's not as simple mm -hmm. as it seems um, one of the things we've looked at is maybe taking advantage of other charitable organizations who run um, vans and we can use their services or they can refer into us um, so we, we don't work on our own we work in partnership with a lot of the other um, voluntary sector so that, that would those could be options okay. yeah okay um, we did touch on rent arrears, but somebody's uh, sent a question in here that they, they have arrears with their rent um, and they really don't know what to do. Are you able to help them? Yes, and, and that's really important because it's, you know, we always say to people, there are certain things you must pay um, in order to have, you know, a secure life and, and your rent, your house is one of them. And so having rent arrears, the most important thing is to come as soon as possible. Don't let them build up to a point where it's then unmanageable and it's harder to find support available um, and then you're at risk of eviction. So yes, as soon as you're falling into rent arrears or if you think you're going to struggle, if you can see ahead and see there's a problem there, come and ask for advice and we can look at options. Yeah, so it's, it's pre-empting a problem that yes. might be about to erupt. Yeah, don't, yeah. Don't, don't let problems get to the point where then it's a crisis. Mm. Um, do you provide an advocacy service around housing issues is one of the other questions. We do give housing advice and, and it will depend on the um, specialism within the citizens advice that, that you um, approach. So um, 
they may do, but if, if you're talking do we actually turn up at court for you, that can be limited because also it depends where your court is in relation to um, your citizen's advice. So you, you need to ask what's available. But if you mean by advocacy, would we phone up and speak to your housing officer because you're struggling or you know you can't understand what they're saying then yes we can do that for you fantastic okay um and i think we're coming up to our last question which um is from michael uh is the citizens advice a charity yes yeah, so each citizen's advice is an independent charity so citizens advice east suffolk is one independent charity then there's citizens advice ipswich which is another independent charity so yes we are we have charitable aims and um we are registered with the charity commission Okay. Well, Chiara, that's fantastic. Um, you've given us all some great advice there. And uh, I hope anybody that's out there struggling and not knowing what to do, um, you know, at least they know there's somewhere to turn to. Now, I really don't think we realise the wide range of uh, services that you're able to offer. So um, it's really, really interesting to hear about. Now, our final guest is Emma Crowhurst, and Emma's a real great advocate of making use of uh, all of her ingredients, particularly with her batch cooking, um, which helps to reduce food waste, something we're all conscious of. And of course, it makes our money go much further. So um, before we chat to Emma, we caught up with her a few days ago in her kitchen at home. Um, she's going to be whipping up a fantastic tomato-based sauce and she's going to be showing us how to use it to create lots of different dishes. Um, and this is all around using low-cost, nutritious food and making it go a long way. So let's take a look. Hello, my name is Emma Crowhurst and I'm going to show you how to make a fantastic, versatile tomato sauce. You can use it for so many things. Let's have a look at the ingredients. So we've got onions, carrots, tin tomatoes, garlic, uh, passata, which I'll tell you about in a moment, a stock cube and some uh, bay leaves and a little bit of oil. So we'll get straight onto it. So what I'm going to do is put some oil into a pan. So I'm going to use a frying pan just so you can see what's going on. Normally I'd use a deeper saucepan that would have a tight fitting lid. So in here, we're going to have a not too hot pan and I'm going to put the onions in first, which have already been finely chopped, as fine as you can. Oh, there's a dodgy bit there. Um, and these are going to go in, and then um, these are going to cook along with the carrots. Now, in here, you could also have leek and celery. Often, I have a look in my fridge and see what's available to use um, any hard vegetables, pretty much, um, except for potatoes, really. And then these are going to start to cook. Now, this is pretty hot quite quickly. I'm going to add the garlic in, which has been finely crushed. And... Everything here wants to be as small as possible when you're chopping them. So there's a video online, longer version, that you can look for how to uh, chop the vegetables. So here we need to now turn the heat down. Don't want it sizzling too much because I don't want it to colour. We want to sweat the vegetables, which means to cook without colour so that the natural sweetness comes out and we don't get all of that sort of acidity that you get from onions. So this could take up to 20 minutes. Stirring it now and again, and as I say, in a saucepan, you can bung a lid on that and that will help to keep it cooler. But I've got one that I've already done here. What also happens is that you lose a lot of the volume. So on this one, I've got um, only one onion in here, a smaller onion. And what you can see is that this veg has started to become translucent and it's also starting to be squidgy. So it's nice and, nice and soft. So it means you get more natural sweetness. In a tin of tomatoes, a tin of tomato sauce, you might have up to 10 teaspoons of sugar. So making your own at home is really brilliant. So now I'm going to turn up the heat. So let me remind you, we've got carrots, onions and garlic in here, nicely sweated until soft. So now I've got a tin of tomatoes. So this is chopped tomatoes and I'm going to put that in. And obviously when you're making a large quantity, you can use a large saucepan and you can use four or five onions, four or five carrots. Um, three tins of tomatoes, you've got the recipe for this, and you can make a large volume. So in here now we can add a little bit of water. I'm going to rinse out the pan, uh, rinse out the um, can I should say, not pan, and then chuck that in so that there's no waste. And into here can go a bay leaf, uh, you can use a stock cube. So the stock cube could be vegetable stock, or it could be chicken or beef stock if you're going to turn this into a meat sauce. So that can go straight in. It's going to cook for a while, so we don't need to dissolve that. 
and also some dried herbs or you could use some fresh herbs if you've got some parsley thyme rosemary um, but a jar of herbs like this is great so measure this out into your hand nice little um, teaspoon or so and then we want to cook this up so I'm going to bring it to the boil and we're going to cook this up then turn it down to simmer so that it can cook for as long as possible so you can stick a lid on it if you've got it in a saucepan and then you can cook that until it's nice and um, mushy and mixed and it depends on how thick you want it to be as to how much you cook it down we're going to add in a few seasonings as well as well as the herbs so there's a little bit of salt going in but we can add a little bit more later to taste and an important seasoning with tomatoes is sugar so sugar will help to balance the acidity of the tomatoes and is a great seasoning anyway also we've got some pepper but i will always do the final seasoning when it's finished because i might want this quite thin to go with pasta or i might want it thicker to go on top of a pizza base so that's the tomato sauce cook that for um 20 minutes to an hour depending on how long you've got and um and then you've got your delicious finished sauce that we can use for so many things Right, so we've got our mm, delicious finished tomato sauce. But I want to tell you some more ideas about how you can make this into loads of different meals. So if you want to make a meat-based sauce for bolognese, lasagna or cottage pie, you can take some beef mince, fry it off in a pan so it's nice and brown, and then pop that in when the tomato sauce starts its cooking time. You need to cook it for about 40 minutes or longer if you can, and it's going to be delicious. Served with a baked potato, lasagna, cottage pie, bolognese with pasta, fantastic. If you want to go a step further, you can take your meat base or not, but add in red kidney beans, dried chilies or fresh chilies, and you can turn your tomato sauce into a delicious um, chili sauce or a beef chili sauce. So fantastic, served with rice or in a baked potato or in tacos. If you want to go vegetarian, we've got red lentils, which are brilliant. They go straight in when your tomato sauce starts its cooking time with some added water to allow for the fact that the lentils will suck up the water and you don't want it to burn. And into there, you can add your kidney beans, your chilies. So you've got a delicious vegetarian or vegan chili. Fantastic. So all of these recipes are available for you to find online at Food Savvy with loads of ideas about how you can cook in bulk, avoid food waste, and freeze your food so that at any time you've got a delicious meal in your freezer that you can just pull out to enjoy. Well, that all looked absolutely delicious. Uh, and both the recipe and the video will be on our website later on, uh, along with an extended version of a video where Emma's showcasing a few more cooking skills for us. So welcome to Your Carp Live, Emma. Um, you've had an illustrious career as a chef and also teaching cookery, but I know you've been doing a lot of work with Food Savvy, which is a partnership between Hubbub and uh, Norfolk and Suffolk Councils. And they help people to create affordable, healthy meals, uh, making their ingredients go further and reducing food waste, which is so important at the moment. Um, can you give us a few tips and pointers as to how we can make our food go much further and, and save some money? Yes, yeah, so I think the whole idea of batch cooking is, uh, is a really good idea. So in that video, I was cooking in quite a small saucepan. So if you can use the biggest saucepan that you've got, you could make a, um, you know, that same recipe, but with four tins of tomatoes, a load of lentils, maybe some meat as well. Um, but the more veg and more lentils, the further you can stretch it. So it's about sort of looking at recipes and thinking, right, what could I put into this of the cheaper ingredients that will help me to, to make it go further? And then you can um, cool it down and then either fridge it or freeze it in the portion sizes that you want. So I think thinking about what you want to cook in advance and maybe using the recipes from Food Savvy. So there's loads of recipes online at Food Savvy and, and other places actually, where you can plan your meals, therefore you can shop to suit. You know, you, you'd never want to shop, they say, on, a, on an empty stomach, mm. otherwise you end up <laughs> buying all the, and, you know, all, all the things that maybe aren't, aren't so good. But you know, thinking about healthy meals, if you can cook, cook from scratch, because inevitably that means you can shop and cook seasonally which 
ingredients are usually cheaper when they're in season. So that means that you can, you can make, um, hopefully, affordable, um, cheaper meals that you can stretch to go further. And just keep an eye on what's going on in your fridge. Um, we all can sort of lose sight, especially if you've got a massive fridge. You can lose sight of what's going on where, and then you end up not using things. Um, another good thing is to make sure you understand what a best before date is, as opposed to a use by date. So use by or the sell by is most often used with high risk foods, foods that have got to be eaten within that time. But the best before just means that it's usually on dry goods like pasta or rice. So they might be slightly past their best, but they're definitely still usable. No, that's really good advice. Now, I know before that you've mentioned uh, different ways about using the freezer to, to take advantage of um, batch cooking and also making sure we don't waste too much mm. food. Can you give us some tips on that? Well, if you've got a good freezer space, then you can, you can plan it quite well. I mean, I try to reduce using plastic at home, but I do have some really good freezer bags that anything that's not used for high-risk food, I wash and reuse. So high risk food is anything like, you know, sort of meat based mm. stuff, basically, or meat based sources like gravies and stuff. So um, what I tend to do is once I've cooked in bulk, whatever I'm cooking, I then uh, cool it down, chuck it into a bag, a Ziploc bag, so it's quite flat. And then I freeze it flat on a tray in my chest freezer. And then once it's flat, I can then put it to the bottom where I've got all my sauces, stews, and it... And it mostly works well for um, wet things like sauces and stews and stuff like that. And then uh, it's like a little sort of filing cabinet. And in the old days, I used to have to warn my children because I'd whack it with a rolling pin <laughs> and just break some off rather than having plastic containers that take up a lot of space in mm. your freezer. So also, if you're looking through your fridge and you've got vegetables that are about to sort of like not be any good anymore, then you can roast them off in the oven when you've got your oven on for something else. And then again, chill them, freeze them, bag them up, and they can be then chucked into pasta, rice dishes, couscous, that kind of thing. Um, so it's a really good way of sort of making, keeping an eye on what's in your fridge. And then, you know, if they're not gonna last in your fridge, if you haven't managed to sort of plan that week's meals so well, then make sure that you don't waste it, but that you chuck it in the freezer. Yeah, and also making use of the oven, you know, yeah, as you absolutely. were just saying, putting oh, yeah. something in the same time as you're cooking. Yeah, dinner, I never definitely. put the oven on for just one thing. I've usually got like a stack of things that I want to do in the oven. So if I'm cooking a meal, I mean, sometimes I might make a massive thing of um, basic tomato sauce or spag bol, and, um, and I'll cook that in the oven rather than on, on the top of the stove because I might be wanting to use the oven for something else. Really good tips there. Um, now, Food Savvy, who you work with, mm -hmm. um, they've done some research in Norfolk and Suffolk, um, and that's shown that households in those counties waste on average £730 worth of edible food a year. That's mm. a huge Terrible. amount, and we could all do with some extra cash in our pockets at the mm. moment. Um, and it seems to be bread that's one of the most wasted mm. items. So um, it's uh, suggested that over 20 million slices of bread are wasted every mm. single day in the UK, which is just phenomenal. Mm. Um, it's a staple in our homes. So what advice can you give um, so we don't end up throwing our bread away? Yeah, it's, it's a good one, but um, there's loads of ways that you can utilize what you've got. So I would say buy the best bread that you can afford because it will last for longer. Um, and if you're going to, if you're not sure how much bread you're going to be eating and you've got a bit of space in your freezer, then you can um, wrap it up and maybe bag it in um, four slice packets so that then you'll never waste any. But that's, that's relying on that you've got a little bit of freezer space. So if the bread is starting to look a bit sort of like as if it's coming to the end of its life, then you can do several things with it. So you can dry the slices in the oven when you've got the oven on for something else and then crumble them up and use them to go on top of things like actually anything that is like a sort of a wet based sauce. So um, garnish on pasta, you can sprinkle garlic granules onto the bread as it's drying and you can use it as a crunchy topping for pasta. Um, you could crunch it up properly with a rolling pin afterwards and then dry bread crumbs will keep in a jar for ages because they're dry and no moisture can make them go moldy. So dry bread crumbs are really good. And again, you can stir those through um, things like um, macaroni cheese, 
um, use them to bread the outside of fish or chicken thighs is really nice with little bits of seasoning. And you can freeze fresh breadcrumbs if you want to as well. And then they're useful to go in um, certain recipes. But also, um, you know, use them as, as a croup for something. So we base our meals often around carbohydrates. So pasta, potatoes, you know, why not for a main course? have a piece of bread and put your stew or your pasta onto the bread. In the old days, you never had plates. You just had a slab of bread. The stew would go on top. I'm talking about the very old days. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, by the time you get to eat the bread, the bread is nice and soft. Also, those little sandwich bag things that are useful for the toasters. Um, so you don't need a sort of posh sandwich machine. But if you make a sandwich with slightly stale bread, and then squish it into one of those little non-stick sandwich bags, squeeze it tight, lob it in the toaster, and that will freshen up the bread and make it feel like it's fresh. Some fantastic tips there. Um, now, a colleague was telling me that they've just purchased an air fryer to try and reduce fuel costs. Um, there's obviously a load of other kitchen equipment mm. available to um, help, such as microwaves, for those of us who are time poor mm. and, and cost sensitive. Can you give us any tips about low cost meals that can be cooked using that type of equipment? Well, I think, I mean, the microwave is great um, and you need to know your microwave because they've got the different sort of settings, but you can make a cake in the micro microwave. If you take um, the weight of an egg and match it with sugar, flour and butter, mix them all together. It's got to be self-raising flour with a little bit of added raising agent. You can bung that in a mug, buttered mug, and you can make a quick cake, which is, which is always fun for children to do. Um, but my sort of go-to bit of kitchen kit is my mother's old slow cooker. So with a slow cooker, you can take all kinds of nice vegetables um, or slightly, you know, look at ones that are looking a little bit worse for wear. And you can bung those in the slow cooker with a tin of tomatoes, um, some garlic and, um, you know, pretty much any sort of herbs that you like and then leave that to cook throughout the day and at the end of the day you've got a lovely vegetable stew things like sweet potatoes butternut squash all will go really well in there because they'll suck up the flavor and then um, use it as a stew or um, you know you can really let it cook down to nothing and, and have it as a really sort of lovely thick homely comfort soup yeah it's all about just thinking about things yeah. isn't it and planning yeah and keeping an eye on your fridge because that always gets away from us, I think, if you don't know what's going on and what's going to be going out of date first. So, useful. Now, we've got a few questions in here. Um, so, the first one is from Michael. Uh, what recipes are there for anyone that's got no access to cook, excuse me, cooking facilities? Okay, so that's a really tricky one. I mean, you saw me cooking in my kitchen on my little gas stove, um, and there's a load of one-pot recipes that are really useful. Um, but if you haven't got any cooking facilities at all, then my, one of my go-to things at home is, is a sort of um, tuna, tuna fish and bean salad, which is really healthy and nutritious. So you just get cooked tin beans, things like um, cannellini beans or um, even red kidney beans, any beans that are already cooked. You can drain them, bung them into a bowl, tin of tuna fish, and I would use the oil from the tuna fish to help make the dressing. You can add some lemon. Um, if you want to posh it up a bit, you can put in some anchovies or olives and stuff like that. But that basic um, meal, you've got your protein, you've got um, you know, lovely sort of fish, which is really good for you, oily fish, which is great. And then you can chuck in herbs and things like that. But I mean, you know, that's a real challenge if you're cooking and you've got no cooking facilities at all. But, but literally with the things that are in this bag, even... we've got chickpeas, again, protein, cooked lentils, anything, anything that's in a tin is only in that tin um, as a means of preserving it. So, I mean, it wouldn't be as nice to have raw, um, not raw, but, you know, tin tomatoes um, and um, chickpeas or lentils thrown together. Won't be as nice, but it will be, um, it will nutritious, be nutritious, very nutritious. It? And with a little bit of seasoning, you could turn that into something yep. delicious. No, that's great. Thank mm. you. Uh, what have we got here? So another question that's come in, um, what teaching resources would you recommend for introducing and extending learning in the secondary school classroom on issues of waste and sustainability? Okay, so I used to be a food teacher um, in a school in Ipswich and um, I tried to incorporate that into all of my lessons about reducing food waste, um, you know, food miles, 
again, you know, things like avocados have a massive amount of food miles. So um, I would say the sort of eating locally and seasonally is a really great way to um, introduce sustainability um, and um, talking about composting. I always used to save all the waste that the students produced, take it home in my little caddy and take it home for my compost. I think they thought I was a bit odd doing that. But, but you know, I would always relate everything to where we lived, what they saw in the fields. Um, Food Savvy have some great resources, so that's something that I would definitely look into. And there's loads of stuff available online. But I think um, just getting kids with a small knife in a safe environment, chopping board, secured, getting them cut, cutting vegetables, you know, raw salads at first maybe, and, um, you know, reducing the waste as much as you possibly can to get them thinking about what they're eating, where it's from, and reducing food waste. Fantastic. Uh, so we've got another question here. Uh, what temperature can I safely run my fridge at to reduce costs but still keep the food fresh? Okay, so your fridge should be between one and five degrees. So obviously an area like the door is going to be slightly warmer. So normally you keep your meat at the bottom, um, at the back, so that it also doesn't drip on anything. But that also tends to be quite a cold place in the fridge. So that's basically, you know, that's the right temperature. And if you want to test whether your fridge is running properly at the right temperature or if you've got it at the right setting, you can get a, any kind of thermometer and either leave it in the fridge or a digital thermometer that you can poke into a, either a packet of butter or some jelly, then you can actually see, because most people's fridges are running higher than that, normally up to um, seven or eight degrees. And eight degrees and above, eight to 63 degrees, is what we call the danger zone where bacteria can multiply um, and possibly become dangerous. So it's really important that your fridge is nice and cold. Okay. Uh, we have another question here. Um, I live by myself and I'm struggling to make different, different meals each day. What can you suggest? I've usually got a couple f cupboard full of food, but I don't know where to start. Well, I think if you're willing to cook from scratch, then it's a good idea, as I mentioned earlier, to base your meals around the starchy things. So, for ex and, and even chefs struggle to cook new things every day. So you're not alone um, in that. Um, so if you do something um, with potatoes one day, <clears throat> maybe pasta the next day, couscous is a brilliant product. I mean, all of those things on their own are a bit dull, but the idea is to get some, some flavour. So, for example, with something like couscous, all you have to do is boil a kettle, bung the couscous into a bowl or something, and then pour the boiling water, perhaps you've made it with stock first, um, about a couple of millimetres over the top of the couscous and then you cover it with a plate and you let it swell because it's, it's pre-cooked. So it just needs to swell back up. And then into that, you can put all kinds of exciting things from tinned fish to chopped up ham. So it's one of those recipes that you can, well, it's not even a recipe really, you can look in the fridge and you can think, what can I use in here? So all the things that need using up, you can put into um, couscous and, it, and treat pasta just the same. So whether it's a hot pasta dish or a cold pasta salad, it's a great way to use up the things in your fridge. And you just need to sort of look online for some recipes. In fact, there are recipes um, and websites online where you can put in the ingredients that you've got and it will give you a whole selection of recipes that you can make. So then it's down to your cooking skills. You're making me think here, because I know I throw far too much food away, but be honest, do you throw any away? I try not to, um, but yes, you know, and, and when I do, I'm really cross with myself. So if there's a pepper that's gone a little bit sort of manky, I cut round that and get rid of that. Mm -hmm. And then I do, as I've said, you know, I would, I would then um, do something with it, like sweat it and make it into a red pepper sauce or just chop it up or just eat it, eat it raw. Just, I, I can't bear waste. It's, it's wrong. Yeah, it is completely. I agree. I'm guilty though. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and uh, last question we've got coming up here. So what fresh foods would you recommend for a long shelf life at home? OK, so any fresh foods that are able to be frozen, you know, I mean, in terms of vegetables, you will need to prep them before you freeze them. So there's this old thing called blanching where you bung your um, veg and there's different blanching times for different veg. But you can look that up online. You can blanch them in boiling water put them in cold water to stop the cooking, drain them, and then they can be frozen. So fresh foods that you buy, you need to stick to 
the use by date if they are high risk foods. So all the meats, dairy, that kind of thing. But anything like cheese, if I feel I've got too much cheese, I grate it and then freeze it. So that then you're ready to take it straight from the freezer and, um, and use it. So, um, you know, you can look up online if you've got a glut of some particular fresh food, there'll be something there online to tell you how to keep it. But using the freezer is a great way to, to prolong the life of your food. But otherwise, I'd just say you, you, you need to stick to the use by date, of all high risk foods. But the best before date, you can be a little bit more flexible with that. That's great, Emma. Um, some really good tips there. Um, so thank you for joining us tonight. We've enjoyed that. Um, thank you to you at home as well for all of your fantastic questions. Okay, so uh, we're almost at the end of the show. Thank you very much to all of our guests. Thank you to Kiara Saunders um, from the Citizens Advice Bureau, uh, Chef Emma Crowhurst, and of course, uh, Michael Beckett, the Chief Executive here at Colchester Food Bank. And uh, thank you, Michael, again for having us here this evening. Um, after tonight's show, if you head to our website at www, too many Ws, www.eastofengland.coop and click on the community page, you'll find links to a number of organisations who are able to offer a range of support. You'll also be able to find uh, Emma's delicious recipes and the video we showed earlier in the show. There's also a link to some great recipes from Food Savvy, plus other Your Co-op Live episodes featuring some more great, low-cost, nutritious meals. In the next few minutes, you'll receive an email from us asking for your feedback on tonight's Your Co-op Live. We really do value your comments, so please do let us know what you think. And if you have any ideas for future episodes, we'd love to hear them too. You'll also find there a discount voucher to help you when you next shop with us. Finally, thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, we're donating five pounds for every person who's watched tonight's live show to the local food banks across our region that we support. So by getting involved, you're all helping to make a real difference to local people in need of those emergency food supplies. So thank you again for joining us tonight here in Colchester. Uh, thank you to everyone, everyone here. We had some really great tips and advice, I think. So thank you very much. Uh, please enjoy the rest of your evening and uh, we'll see you very soon. <laughs>